medical supplies for public health emergencies, and ASEAN standard operating procedures for public health emergencies. Various sectors have been encouraged to continue working together to address both the public health and socio-economic impacts of the pandemic. All stakeholders are enjoined to take part in crafting a framework for ASEAN's COVID-19 recovery plan. This is how ASEAN demonstrates its vision of leaving no one behind. This pandemic forced us to impose severe measures to address its effects. The Philippines established and implemented stringent and comprehensive action plans to prevent the spread of COVID-19 since March and continues to ramp up its testing capacity to contain the spread of COVID-19. We commend our frontline workers for their bravery and sacrifices and for taking care of our people, sometimes at the cost of their own lives. As we learn more about the virus and await news about the discovery of a vaccine and medicines, the International Monetary Fund expects economic growth to resume next year, with the ASEAN 5 predicted to bounce back to 7.8% growth in 2021, with the condition that the region continues to work together to contain the virus. The Philippines and other ASEAN member states are committed to working together in a cohesive and coordinated manner to address COVID-19. With our collective efforts, we can be a model of cooperation on pandemic preparedness, response, and recovery. We believe ASEAN will come out of this crisis stronger, more united, and prepared for future challenges that the region may encounter. Marami salamat po sa inyong lahat. Mabuhay! Thank you very much, Assistant Secretary Juniper M. Mahilum West. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Sama Sama ASEAN Webinar Series, Episode 2. The Sama Sama ASEAN Webinar Series forms part of the commemoration of the ASEAN Month this August. This is the second of the four webinar series organized by the ASEAN Committee on Culture and Information, or COCI, of the Philippines, composed of Department of Foreign Affairs, Presidential Communications Operations Office, Philippine Information Agency, People's Television Network Incorporated, or PTV, Cultural Center of the Philippines, and National Commission for Culture and the Arts. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Diane Carrer, Miss Philippines Earth Air 2014 TV host and news anchor from PTV of the Philippines. I will be your host for today. Before we move on to the presentation of our speakers, allow me to reiterate the house rules for today's webinar. Choose a quiet location, does your connections, speakers, and microphones. Use of earphones is recommended to minimize background noise. Use your full name for proper identification. Keep your microphone on mute except when you are recognized to speak. Use the Q&A feature should you wish to ask a question to our resource speakers. We hope that you will stay present and stay with us all throughout this webinar. And we would appreciate if you could provide your feedback on this webinar through the polling feature, which we will activate after the presentation of our last speaker. To all the attendees and the netizens joining us today for your online post about the webinar, do not forget to use the hashtag, hashtag Sama Sama as we also like to acknowledge our friends from Brunei, Cambodia, Myanmar for the dance video performances which were played during the pre-program of this webinar. You may have also heard a series of beautiful music from the album Memories on Two Strings, composed and performed by our very own Filipino composer, Mr. Diwa de Leon, using a traditional two-string lute guitar called the Hegelong. You may have also heard the song entitled let us move ahead, which was composed by Kandra Darusman from Indonesia as a project of the ASEAN COCI. We also featured the song entitled ASEAN Spirit, which was the banner song for the Philippines Chairmanship of ASEAN in 2017, performed by Mr. Christian Bautista. Now, before we give you our resource speakers, allow us to treat you first to a video performance. The National Commission for Culture and the Arts, 
and the Cultural Center of the Philippines have teamed up with the focal agencies on culture from the ASEAN member states to present a project dubbed as Break the Chain, the Arts Respond to COVID-19 and Awareness Campaign. It is a compilation of video performances of traditional folk classical dances from the ASEAN member states, which were especially choreographed to promote the different health protocols. This video performance is Pangalai. This dominant dance style of the indigenous peoples of the Sulu archipelago is predominantly performed during weddings with elaborate finger and wrist movements that resemble the washing of hands. Hence, the dance is primarily used to convey the essential health protocol, such as hand washing, and ends with the ritual of wearing of masks to prevent the spread of the pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Philippines.
Thank you very much, Philippines. Today's session of Sama Sama ASEAN webinar series carries the theme, Building Cultural Solidarity and Voices of Resilience Amid the Pandemic. Now, without further ado, allow me to introduce to you our first resource speaker, who will be providing us an overview of ASEAN and how this one community benefits us all. Please welcome the Executive Director of the Office of ASEAN Affairs of the Department of Foreign Affairs, Executive Director Marian Jocelyn R. Pirol Ignacio. Good morning to our distinguished panel of guests and good morning to our viewers. I'm Marian Tirol Ignacio, Executive Director of the Office of ASEAN Affairs. So I'm happy to be part of Sama Sama ASEAN, sharing awareness on the region we belong to. I will begin with a brief overview of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN. ASEAN is composed of countries in the Southeast Asian region. It was established on the 8th of August, 1967 by five founding nations, namely Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, and of course, the Philippines. They were later joined by Brunei Darussalam, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam, thus creating the regional organization that we know today as ASEAN. This year marks ASEAN's 53rd founding anniversary. Symbols are important. As citizens of ASEAN, we should be familiar with the ASEAN emblem. It is composed of 10 rice stalks symbolizing the 10 ASEAN member countries. The circle surrounding the rice stalks signifies the unity among ASEAN countries. The ASEAN flag prominently displays the emblem against a distinct blue background which symbolizes peace, one of ASEAN's aspirations. ASEAN's motto is one vision, one identity, one community, emphasizing unity in our diversity. Did you know the ASEAN community was originally envisioned to be established this year, 2020, but ASEAN was ready and formally launched it in 2015. In the Declaration on the Establishment of the ASEAN Community issued at the 27th ASEAN Summit in Kuala Lumpur on the 22nd of November 2015, the ASEAN leaders said, the realization of the ASEAN Community has set a milestone in the integration process and will ensure lasting peace, security, and resilience in an outward-looking region with economies that are vibrant, competitive and highly integrated, and an inclusive community that is embedded with a strong sense of togetherness and common identity. There are many elements to this statement mentioning peace and security, economy and a sense of community. Let's take a closer look at the structure of ASEAN. We can think of the ASEAN community as a house with three pillars namely the political security community, economic community, and sociocultural community. For the Philippines, the three pillars are coordinated by the Department of Foreign Affairs for Political Security, the Department of Trade and Industry for Economic, and the Department of Social Welfare and Development for the sociocultural community. That's no more about the community of ASEAN and how it will benefit us as Filipinos. When ASEAN was formed back in 1967, it aspired for peace in an otherwise unstable environment. ASEAN was established to promote regional peace, collaboration, and mutual assistance on matters of common interest. As a political security community, ASEAN's member states have a common shared stake in being internally resilient and promoting a rules-based, outward-looking region that enjoys lasting peace, security, and stability. It follows the principles of the ASEAN Charter, uses consultation and consensus building, and adheres to the use of peaceful means in resolving disputes. To build a rules-based, people-oriented, people-centered community, the political security community has consistently promoted cooperation in political development that adheres to the principles of democracy, the rule of law, and good governance, 
as well as respect for promotion and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms. As interdependence deepened in the region and with ASEAN centrality in mind, ASEAN engaged like-minded countries through the ASEAN Regional Forum. The forum's objectives include engagement in constructive dialogue and consultation on political and security issues and efforts towards confidence building and preventive diplomacy in the Asia Pacific. 27 countries, including Australia, Canada, China, Timor Leste, India, Japan, Papua New Guinea, the Republic of Korea, Russia, and the United States are members of the ARF. Another important milestone on their political security pillar is the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia, a peace treaty established by the founding countries of ASEAN and signed into force on February 24, 1976. To date, 38 countries are signatories to the TAC, which espouses specific settlement of regional disputes and for regional cooperation to achieve peace amity and friendship among the peoples of Southeast Asia in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations. The political security pillar also addresses commonly shared non-traditional security challenges, including drug trafficking, trafficking in persons, terrorism, disasters, among others. The ASEAN Economic Community aspires to improve the lives of ASEAN citizens by moving towards a freer movement of goods, services, capital, and skilled labor. It aims to be a single market and production base, a highly competitive economic region pursuing equitable economic development, and one fully integrated into the global community. These will boost both ASEAN's intra-regional economy as well as its attractiveness to external economic partners as an investment destination and a consumer base of 640 million people. ASEAN is one of the world's economic success stories. The region has grown by an average of 5.3% annually since 2000, far above the global average of 3.8%. It has a combined GDP of US $2.8 trillion in 2017 collective market of more than 640 million consumers and a young demographic and a growing middle class. ASEAN is committed to achieving sustained, balanced, and inclusive economic growth and to safeguard our economies against global risks and uncertainties. There is a conscious commitment to keep our markets open for trade and investment. Strengthening intra-ASEAN trade and investment will bolster collective resilience against internal and external shocks. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, is a step in this direction with negotiated topics such as trade in goods and services, investments, technical cooperation, intellectual property, e-commerce, and the small and medium enterprises. It will bring together 3 billion people, or 45% of the world's population, as well as generate a combined GDP of nearly $21.3 trillion, accounting for nearly 40% of world trade. ASEAN hopes to sign the RCEP within the year. The economic community is also significant to the world's recovery from COVID-19. ASEAN is working on policy measures to mitigate the economic impacts of the outbreak, particularly on micro, small, and medium enterprises, business startups, and the more vulnerable sectors in the region. ASEAN also recognizes the important role of the private sector in the post-pandemic recovery efforts, restarting the economy, rehiring, and restoring business and consumer confidence, as well as studying a proposal for the creation of a high-level special committee that will address the aftermath of the pandemic alongside other ASEAN mechanisms is now the chief concern of the ASEAN economic community. ASEAN community building must make a difference in the lives of our citizens who are the beneficiaries of a people-oriented, people-centered ASEAN. Social cultural community building focus on ongoing initiatives to narrow the development gap 
among member states and to widen and deepen connectivity in the region. The ASEAN sociocultural community is deluged by challenges brought on by COVID-19. This pillar is focused on community building that engages and benefits our peoples and aims to make ASEAN more inclusive, sustainable, resilient, and dynamic. This pillar also focuses on health, education, labor, disaster management, vulnerable populations, information, culture and identity, and many more. Our health sector is instrumental in an ASEAN response to the COVID-19 pandemic that is timely and appropriate. The ASEAN Emergency Operations Center Network for Public Health Emergencies provide a platform among ASEAN member states officials working at their respective crisis centers on disease prevention and control to share information in a timely manner. The ASEAN COVID-19 Response Fund is a pool of funds that would allow ASEAN member states to receive financial assistance for an enhanced response to COVID-19. ASEAN is nearing the operationalization of the ASEAN Regional Reserve of Medical Supplies and Equipment for Public Health Emergencies, the ASEAN Standard Operating Procedures for Public Health Emergencies, and an ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Plan, all designed to bolster the regional health system of ASEAN nations. With COVID-19, ASEAN connectivity takes on a deeper meaning, highlighting the importance of a more resilient and well-connected ASEAN. With COVID-19, countries opt to restrict movement to contain its spread. Businesses closed, people lost income, and restricted access to education. The pandemic disrupted the global supply chain, affecting the flow of essential goods, such as medicines and protective equipment, and food. ASEAN's connectivity is important in mitigating the impact of COVID-19. We have the opportunity to rebuild a better ASEAN through investment in critical infrastructure to facilitate movement of goods, services, and labor, and scale up su supply chain efficiency, building and development cooperation. We have sectoral dialogue partnerships with Pakistan, Norway, Switzerland, and with Turkey being the latest in which concrete cooperation is pursued in more specific issue areas. ASEAN conducts regular meetings with these partners through the ASEAN Plus Three meetings, the East Asia Summit, and of course, ASEAN Plus One meetings to discuss a broad range of issues of mutual concern. The ASEAN COVID-19 Response Fund has received wide support from many partners which would allow ASEAN member states to draw from a pooled source of funds to carry out efforts to contain the spread of the virus. These efforts would not be at this level of sophistication if not for the 53 years of existing cooperation among ASEAN member states and its partners. Despite the unparalleled challenge posed by COVID-19, we move to exemplify this year's theme of a cohesive and responsive ASEAN, ready to face challenges together, ready to assist one another, always working towards building a stronger ASEAN community. So thank you for taking your time to learn more about ASEAN and have a great day. Thank you very much, Executive Director Marian Jocelyn R. Tirol Ignacio. If you have questions about that first presentation, kindly type in all your questions in the Q&A chat box. Just click the Q&A icon, which you can find at the bottom of the interface of this webinar. And we have our friends from the Department of Foreign Affairs or DFA to directly answer your questions through the Q&A chat box as well. Now to our attendees inside the webinar, we have been monitoring the webinar chat box and we monitored that some of you are having technical problems in terms of your audio. We advise that you kindly check your connection, make sure that your internet connection is stable. Second, please use earphones to be able to hear clearly the presentation of our resource speakers. And lastly, kindly maximize the volume level of your in your mobile phone or in your laptop, whichever you are using in watching in today's webinar. Thank you. Let us know if your audio gets better.
Now moving on, as part of the Break the Chain, the arts respond to COVID-19 and awareness campaign. For our second dance video presentation, here is Glorious Bagan Dance. This video campaign inspired from the mural paintings of Bagan era, the dance patterns and costumes in this performance are specially designed and choreographed to creatively show the proper way of hand sanitizing, wearing a face mask, and observing social distancing. Please welcome our friends from Myanmar. Thank you very much, Myanmar. We will now move on to a series of presentations from our keynote speakers. And I would like to give the floor now to our moderator for today's webinar. Please welcome the Vice President and Artistic Director of the Cultural Center of the Philippines, Mr. Chris B. Miliado. Sir Chris, you have the floor now. Magandang umaga. Uh, good morning from Manila, Philippines. Uh, we greet you with wishes of health and safety wherever you are streaming our conversation today on the topic of building cultural solidarity 
and voices of resilience amid the pandemic. The Sama Sama ASEAN Webinar on Culture is an initiative of the Philippines and a collaborative effort with the agencies of the ASEAN Committee on Culture and Information. The arts and cultural sector is one of the hardest hit sectors by this great pandemic lockdown. Many artists and cultural workers have fallen ill or been struck down by COVID. Scores of dancers, theater actors, music performers, uh, cultural uh, visual artists are jobless. Theaters and performance venues remain closed to the public and until we find a way to control the spread of the pandemic, this situation might remain. Studies show that the arts, culture, entertainment, and tourism sector will be the last to recover due to the nature of its production and engagement processes. Unlike illnesses which are endured individually, a pandemic is widespread and experienced by many communities simultaneously. Because of this pandemic, we have shared and urgent concerns. In the face of uncertainty, we all need to be resilient. Solidarity is imperative. Now, where do we find resilience in our cultures? How do we make resilience actionable? How can resilience inform cultural action? How can our work in art and culture bridge and connect the gaps that have opened wide because of this great pandemic lockdown? These are some of the questions that we hope to tackle in this morning's conversation. And we have Remarkable Collection, Art History and the National Museum, and Past Peripheral, Curation in Southeast Asia. He was a grantee of the Asian Cultural Council and a member of the advisory board of the exhibition, The Global Contemporary Art Worlds After 1989, organized by the Center for Art and Media in Karlsruhe and member of the Guggenheim Museum's Asian Art Council. He co-edited the Southeast Asian issue with Joan Key for third text in 2011. He convened on behalf of the Clark Institute and Department of Art Studies of the University of the Philippines, the conference, Histories of Art History in Southeast Asia in Manila. He was a guest scholar of the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. He curated an exhibition of contemporary art from Southeast Asia and Southeast Europe titled South by Southeast and the Philippine Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. He was the artistic director of the Singapore Biennale in 2019. Friends, please welcome Dr. Patrick Flores. Patrick, you're mute, unmute yourself. You're still muted, Patrick. There you go. Morning, Patrick. Good morning, Chris, and thank you for the introduction. And thank you to ASEAN COCI for this invitation. I'm, I'm, it's my pleasure to be here with all of you uh, virtually uh, this morning. Uh, in reflecting on the, uh, uh, Chris, is my slide showing up? Okay. Yes, it's showing now. It's okay now, no? Yes. I'll just... Okay. So in reflecting on the topic assigned to me for this webinar, I was drawn to the word emergency for obvious reasons. The times we find ourselves in are unprecedented and very humbling. 
leaving us bewildered by the magnitude of the planetary crisis of a pandemic. From the Latin word emergere, which means to bring to light and to arise, the word emergency describes a heightened situation or a critical condition, which is a matter of life and death or agaw buhay in the Philippine language. This is one aspect of emergere. For me as an art historian and curator, the other aspect has something to do with art fundamentally. Art that is sensitive to the world around it seeks to bring to light that which needs to be understood and hopefully transformed. And in doing so, art arises or it steps up as a matter of responsibility to offer critique so that reconstruction or restitution can take place. And here we fish out another pertinent term, which is critique. It must be pointed out that the word critique comes from the Greek word crisis, a delicate moment between survival and perdition, but also an opportunity to deliberate as it was in Athenian democracy, to decide on what to do in a time that is suspended between life and death. Art, therefore, does not only respond to crisis, it emerges or arises and brings to light how the world has come to this tipping point, to the tipping point of this crisis and how it makes sense of it and if an experience necessary to summon the will to rework the world humbly, but also oftentimes compellingly through art. In this regard, Arteri Performa in Indonesia staged an online theater performance of Jemuran Orang, or People's Laundry, which dwells on the plague and how people persevere with their lives in the midst of this catastrophe. For its part, the National Gallery Singapore and the Singapore Art Museum created new programs titled Proposals for Novel Ways of Being, with 12 local art institutions, independent art spaces, and collectives participating, with over 170 local artists and cultural workers to present a wide range of exhibitions and initiatives that explore new ways of living in a world altered by the pandemic, and consider how art can imagine new possibilities for the future and inspire hope during these times. It is in this context of performance, participation, and persistence that I present this morning how artists and cultural workers in the ASEAN region make sense of the critical condition and propose critique so that the world and the larger ecology of forces beyond human beings can transform. I staged this action of artists and cultural workers in the ASEAN in three phases. And these are coping, confronting, calibrating. Firstly, to cope is to survive, to secure a semblance of livelihood, to take a pause, to reflect, to let introspection and patience become vital sources of energy and well-being. The pressure to produce or to be productive is the pressure of an earlier normal. That being said, to cope is not an invitation to be idle. It is only to insist on the need to slow down, to decelerate instead of accelerate, to listen instead of proclaim. It also inspires us to explore our immediate environment and to come to terms with our locality amid a very hectic globalization and intense migration of both peoples and species. To be local, we realize, is to belong to an extensive kinship and not to be alienated from others and be sufficient unto ourselves. Let me cite some examples. The Filipino artist Mark Salvatus shared in an interview the experiences of the artist-led initiative Load Nadito based in Manila and its thoughts about the lockdown measures and movement restrictions enforced locally. He also related how Load Nadito as a family sees the house and the household as a model in creating and adapting to different ways of living 
and these are his words, and created projects shared online such as the Exhibitions for Yoji, an interactive exercise with his five-year-old son Yoji, which presents everyday objects as installations in parts of their home. For its part, the Alliance of Greater Manila Area Museums, or AGMAM, held an online museum talk series titled Surmounting the COVID Challenge with the International Council of Museums in May, led by museum curators in Manila. And how are we doing? A virtual museum community town hall with the Cultural Center of the Philippines in June and a group discussion and plenary session participated in by various museums in Greater Manila. Agmam also facilitated the Cues from the Times Art and Crisis Zoom webinar with the Metropolitan Museum of Manila with artists Yeson Banal, Mark, Salvat, well, sorry, Mark Salvatus, and myself uh, as speakers. Secondly, to confront is to analyze and discuss. It is to investigate, to find out what is wrong and what can be done to clear a path of rightfulness. Art is an ethical gesture as much as it is an aesthetic risk. For instance, the Philippine Educational Theater Associations, PETA Online, and hashtag Let's Get Creative Online program offered theater workshops and classes and posted videos for their regular hashtag storytelling Sundays and hashtag talk Tuesdays among others through their Facebook and YouTube pages. An assistance program called TASDW15, training the trainers, Teatro Ambahanon Dance Right Shop training, was conducted in Ramon Magsaysay Memorial College's General Santos City, South Cotabato in Mindanao as a week-long project which aimed to assist teachers of the special program in performing arts track, track to write and create module content and teach them basic dance through a series of lecture demonstrations. This assistance program was part of the uh, Cultural Center of the Philippines Kalinga ng Sining, Art for Healing and transformation, which supports regional artists, cultural workers, and organizations during the COVID-19 crisis. The Factory Art Center, the Factory Contemporary Art Center, the first independent organization with purpose-built space for contemporary art in Vietnam, initiated hope looking inwards to the outer world. It is an online site that collects and shares responses of artists, friends, and friends during the pandemic. Thirdly, to calibrate is to speculate, to venture into possibilities, to reimagine the normal and what it means to transition into another context or to shift gears towards a different direction. And this direction prompts us to reconceptualize the notion of intimacy, aesthetic experience, and collective appreciation and find new strategies to address them in very innovative ways. We can refer to the following as instructive practices. In Manila, the Virgin Love Fest lockdown edition titled VLF 2020 Capit Lab in the Time of COVID, a virtual love edition featured new and revisited one act plays, staged readings, dramatic readings, and panel discussions and conversations on directing, design, stage management, and playwriting through digital platforms. Still in Manila, the film festival Cinemalaya went online with films being made available on Vimeo, a video platform from August 7 to August 16. Scanning the examples of artistic initiatives in the ASEAN region, I identify, I identify the following tendencies in coping, confronting, and calibrating. Number one, the migration of artistic content to a digital platform as a form of circulation and distribution. Some cases in point. In Brunei, the Federal Academy of Ballet 
shifted to live streaming sessions via Zoom or WhatsApp and created free and trial ballet classes. Some branches opened in the first week of July. Also in Brunei, the Jabata Museum Museums Museum uh, Department created and promoted e-exhibitions or online exhibitions of various museums in Brunei. In Myanmar, the Watan Film Fest, the Watan Film Fest team organized an online creative animation project with animators during the pandemic and uploaded previous shorts and documentary films in their past film festivals since 2011 in their YouTube channel. And in Thailand, uh, this is part of the initiative in uh, Myanmar. And in Thailand, a live six hour online music concert, online music festival, Top Hits Thailand, organized by What The Duck Music was held on June 7th via Zoom featuring Thailand's top rock bands and music artists. And in the Philippines, and this is close to home, the Vargas Museum, which I direct, it's hashtag Vargas Museum virtual mode program circulated works from the collection through online exhibits, created modules and virtually opened recent shows quarantine and form kata prototype via a virtual tour. It also initiated a work from home research internship program for students and young professionals. Number two, these are some instances. Number two, the exploration of a different ecology of materials and techniques beyond the studio, the performance hall, the dramatic stage, the film set, and so on. Because the supply chain of resources has been disrupted, the means and media for art to be produced has changed. Filmmakers, for instance, have developed scenarios for microsites in the internet or artists made art as a way to mark the day alone or with the family. Here are a few experiments. Raki Kahigan, an artist from the Mountain Province in Northern Philippines posted his acrylic works in his personal Facebook page, page which revealed bought goods at a wet market such as fresh meat, fish and vegetables during the quarantine with the caption WIP or work in progress. Uh, um, imagined nation lockdown series no relief chaos found acrylic art patron doctor and founder of pinto art museum hoven guanang took photos of the sunset every day since the quarantine period in his home and museum in antipolo east of the capital Manila, while accepting online medical consultations. He posted them on his personal Facebook page as Pinto Sunset Diary. Jason D, a Catholic priest and artist from the Philippines, regularly posted photos of his different flower arrangements in his personal Facebook page album titled Arrange slash Enliven, which is inspired by Ikebana the Japanese art of arranging flowers and Easter art project involves arranging flowers, plants and other objects. These flowers are to be installed on the altar of the online mass of Radio Katipunan, Jesuit Communications PH, keeping the faith, daily mass for difficult times. Clubhouse Films, a production company in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, shifted to creative projects with remote shooting technology called QTake, a video software assistance used by production films, by production outfits in Vietnam. Number three, the shift in modes of creation and curation of creative work. While migration to digital platforms proves to be an important strategy, it is crucial that the consciousness of creation and curation also transforms. In the long run, migration to the digital platform to circulate and distribute content is not enough. Artists, curators, critics, and the public must reconceptualize what, where, when, and how art is, and the manner in which 
it reaches its constituency wherever they are. In Malaysia, for instance, mana, mana, mana Productions ask an artist, Instagram live series of interviews with theater performing arts practitioners was developed. Also in Malaysia, Moka Moka's Inks Drama Kilat, audio drama series by playwright Ridwan Saidi and Fikira Session talks about film and cinema through FB Live were produced. And also we must not forget the, uh, this is the one from uh, Malaysia, the uh, talk show through FB. And uh, we must not forget the ASEAN musical uh, theater project gathered over 70 musicians and musical theater performers from Southeast Asia to sing Seasons of Love together, a song from Jonathan Larson's uh, hit musical Rent. It was recorded during the lockdown periods and the video was uploaded at the ASEAN Musical Theater Project's YouTube channel. And finally, number four, the enhancement of the role of the artist as a social agent. During the pandemic, artists helped each other, raised funds for the most vulnerable, including their own peers and family members, and also expressed their opinions about government and institutions. As they came to terms with the threat of viral exposure, they also sought to expose, to lay bare the vulnerabilities of society and the various vernacular interventions of civil society and social movements. This interplay between the viral and the vernacular takes us to another plane of reality that might refuse the word normal. In Cambodia, the 75-year-old master Kong Nai, one of the rare great masters of the Chape Dang Veng, a musical tradition which features a lute accompanied by the performer singing, sang about hand washing and social distancing and other COVID-19 safety measures. Machan, the Museum of Modern, I sorry. Machan, the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Jakarta in Indonesia held an Arisan Karya or artwork raffle to, to patrons to support artists. 70% of the proceeds uh, went to the artists or their charity of choice and 30% was allocated to training programs for selected art managers. So this is Museum Machan from Indonesia, not Cambodia. So I am mistaken. And the Mitra Jakarta Museum, um, also foundation in, in Indonesia, held an online auction to support artists during the pandemic. 100% of the sales went to the uh, artists. And in the Philippines, um, Art Relief Mobile Kitchen is a group of volunteers that started in 2013 among artists and cultural workers, such as its founder, the photographer Alex Baluyot whose mission is to feed the hungry through community kitchens. They have been distributing, they have been distributing food aid since the start of the community quarantine and are currently around Barangay Malake, Malake in Los Baños, Laguna, a province south of the capital Manila, as quarantine continues to affect residents of the area. One of their biggest food relief projects was in the evacuation centers in Iligan City, giving 10,000 food aids to victims of the Marawi siege crisis beginning in May 2017. The Orange Project Gallery located in Bacolod's Art District opened its gallery with Art and Isolation collaborative exhibition featuring works by artists made during the quarantine periods. The exhibit opened in June and will run until the 15th of this month. The gallery observes strict health measures by allowing limited viewers and viewing time and limited participants in the talk. And still in the Philippines, Don't Cry to Maui by Art Tugon is a relief operation in response to the insufficient relief goods and aid to some evacuees stranded at the Tumawai evacuation camp in Talisay, Batangas, due to the lockdown caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. They gave rice, they gave bags designed by artist Roger Mon Borja, 
containing a set of hygiene kit, rice, basic canned goods, noodles, dried fish, vegetables, some fruits, plant seeds, and distilled water. In Indonesia, Isa uh, Perkasa sewed red and white colored masks, colors of the Indonesian flag, and distributed them to people passing by his house, located near a bus stop. This work reflects the struggle of artists during the pandemic. While street artist Al Fajar Exgo with Sericat Mural Surabaya Association and Junaidi Sofian created murals to express their opinions on the Indonesian government's response to fight the pandemic. In Thailand, uh, the 19 project uh, gathered Thai photographers to sell their photos online to help aid medical personnel. And in Vietnam, an online project was held organized by the Anin To Do Capital Security newspaper and Indochine RJSC to support frontline medical workers in the fight against COVID-19. It traced 500 million Vietnamese dong, equivalent to around 22,000 US dollars. As we can see in this brief survey of creative efforts in Southeast Asia, the pandemic has inspired the ecology of art and culture to emerge and respond to an intense emergency. I say ecology because it is not only artists who make this possible, but the entire network of cultural workers, curators, administrators, teachers, patrons, government officers, students, technicians, managers, and of course, the general public. Ecology also refers to the ecology of the planet, the fabric of our cosmos, the interconnectedness that we have torn apart and now seek to renew. This ecology translates or transposes into a system of solidarity and sympathy in Southeast Asia reminding all of us that the power of imagination does not diminish in times of crisis and in the face of a universe falling away. Rather, it gathers strength and resolve as it harnesses the many dimensions of creative work through practical intelligence, responsible citizenship, ethical commitment, a mindfulness of species, spirits, and substances, and the will to foresee a possible future of the art and the world to come. In the Visayan language in the Philippines, the word kalibutan means both the world and consciousness. So is it, I think, with art. Art is in the same breath, the ecology of and the responsiveness to a reality we need to create differently and urgently in the midst of uncertainty and um, our tempered talent to prevail, hopefully, selflessly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Patrick Flores. If you have questions about the presentation of Dr. Patrick Flores, better if you type in now your questions in the Q&A chat box so our resource speaker can see your questions in advance. Your questions will be answered during the Q&A session later to be moderated by Sir Chris Miliado. You can access the Q&A chat box by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of the interface of this webinar. Now, before I give you again, Sir Chris, to introduce our last keynote speaker for today, here is another video performance as part of Break the Chain, the Arts Response to COVID-19 and Awareness Campaign. Here is a dance video presentation of Sinulog from the Philippines. Sinulog, the traditional religious festival held in the Philippines, features dances to honor the Santo Nino as the source of protection and hope for the petitioners. This video shows movements that convey courage and perseverance amidst the pandemic and further promote social distancing, proper hand washing, and the proper use of masks. Please welcome again the Philippines.
Thank you, Philippines. Now I give the floor again to Sir Chris Maliado to introduce our last keynote speaker. Sir Chris, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Patrick Flores. And now uh, for our next keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Felipe De Leon. Dr. Felipe De Leon Jr., uh, whom we also fondly uh, call June, Dr. Professor June De Leon, is a professor, writer, painter, and composer. He was chairman of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts from 2011 until 2016. While Mr. De Leon was the chairman of the NCCA, he was the Philippine representative to the ASEAN ministers responsible for culture and arts. He is currently head of NCCA's National Committee on Music. He was chairman of the Humanities Department University of the Philippines, Diliman, and during his term as the department chair, he moved from, for a major shift 
from a Eurocentric to a world art approach with emphasis on Southeast Asian and Philippine arts. Professor De Leon is active in promoting and preserving Philippine indigenous cultural heritage and specializes in aesthetics, music theory, and culture and human development issues. He is a lecturer in the international academic circuit and currently a professor at the Asian Social Institute on Development Studies and Social Transformation courses. Dr. De Leon comes from a highly gifted and musical family. His father is the late Felipe, Felipe Padilla de Leon, national artist for music and composer of two grand operas, the Noli Mitangere and El Felibusterismo, and the most popular Christmas carols, Pasko na Nama, Noche Buena, and Payapang Daigdig. A composer himself, he wrote the music of the socially relevant song Lumuha Ka Aking Bayan with lyrics by national artist Amado V. Hernandez. He has written music for plays and musicals. He has been the musical director since 1985 of Casarinlan, a vocal and instrumental music ensemble dedicated to Philippine music cultures. Let us now converse with Dr. Felipe Jun de Leon. Good morning, Jun. Good morning. Thank you, Chris, for that very wonderful introduction. And I'm very happy to be here to share with you some insights about how culture can help us uh, combat the challenges of today, especially the pandemic. And uh, I'd like to share with you uh, this presentation on nurturing the culture of the common good in ASEAN, a holistic approach to the pandemic. Well, we know that culture is a way of life. It, it shapes the way we live. We are both biological and cultural beings. So when a disease becomes a pandemic and affects a large part of the world, we cope with it in both biological and cultural ways. The impact of the disease can be greater or lesser depending on our values and beliefs, cosmologies, social structures, and economic systems. The common theme from ASEAN leaders to contain the COVID pandemic is to bolster health cooperation measures, share information and experiences, Key supply chains open and facilitate joint research and development of vaccines and antiviral medicines. The commitment to take collective action and coordinate policies. Well, uh, while ASEAN has committed to a unified front to fight against the virus, countries took different paths to achieve this goal because we have different cultures. Now. On the stringency or strictness of public measures to control the spread with COVID, three ASEAN countries that impose the highest level of, of stringency are Vietnam. Laos and the Philippines. But stringency alone, no matter how high the level, is not enough. The doctors said that measures to contain the disease, such as detection, isolation, and contact tracing, had to be done at the very outset of the pandemic. The government should provide and analyze figures, systematically cooperate with news agencies, disseminate information widely, and engage the cooperation of the people. Of course, the countries that implemented this holistic approach and greater successes in beating COVID-19 than those which did not. At the same time, it's important to impose strict measures to control the pandemic without resorting to intimidation and strong arm tactics. Why? Because in most ASEAN countries, where a traditional culture of community self-help still prevails, compassion and not coercion will work better. If we know traditional ASEAN cultures, we know that uh, mountains are sacred. But there's a very strong sense of the sacred in ASEAN. And ASEAN peoples do not like unhappy endings in their stories, which shows a communal consciousness because they don't like people to drift apart from each other. That's why they like happy endings. And first, in most ASEAN traditional societies, art is for everybody. Everybody's an artist. This holistic approach makes sure that there's a strong sense of community and therefore there will be so much compassion and uh, the idea of self-help, which we call Bayanihan. No? Southeast Asian peoples really appreciate the value of discipline, but it has to come from a shared understanding of its importance for the common good. Filipinos, for example, like to be treated as part of a family, where the discipline often enforced by a father figure emanates from love and concern for the common good, no? love, concern for the good of the children, not from the desire to inflict pain alone. Well, Let's look at uh, culture more uh, specifically. Culture is a mindset, the one that determines the political and economic agendas and behavior of nations. 
If a culture prioritizes power and wealth, the consequence will be a divided society with much inequality of power and wealth. On the other hand, if a culture values the common good or social investment more, there will be a more equitable distribution of wealth and power and will not be monopolized by a few. In any society, at any time in the history of the world, uh, in any place, no, there have been at least four cultures. Culture of power, where people are attached to power and privilege, control and domination. The culture of wealth, where people are attached to wealth and material goods, possessions, pleasure, and comfort. The third culture is trust-based rather than fear-based, rather than ego-based. It's the culture of the common good. This is really the culture of ASEAN, no? as I was explaining earlier. This is the culture of the higher self. Uh, in the Philippines, this is what we call pagpakatao. Uh, madaling maging tao, mahirap pagpakatao. It's easy to be born as a human being, but very difficult to be humane. This is the culture devoted to the search for wisdom, spirituality, creativity, strength of character, love, and sharing. The culture of devotion to a higher cause. Some reflections. Persons addicted to the culture of power see themselves as outsiders, feel alienated from, from people, and are purely motivated by self-interest, driven by fear, insecurity, and hatred. They view, they view everybody as a hostile and potential enemies, except for the immediate family and inner circle of allies or friends. They behave like bullies, attempting to subjugate, control, and manipulate others, especially the weak. Being outsiders, they cannot feel compassion for others. The only language they know is force and violence. Persons addicted to the culture of wealth similarly feel as outsiders. They don't have empathy for others and are mostly self-serving. Also driven by inner insecurity and fear of a hostile social and natural environment, they become ruthlessly competitive, amassing wealth at the expense of others. They consider everything, objects, living things, and people as commodities that can be controlled and traded to satisfy their insatiable bid for money. On the other hand, people who belong to the culture of the common good have a deep feeling of being insiders and not separate from a society or a community. They have compassion and capacity to sacrifice for the good of others. Often they are devoted community workers who are not driven by self-interest. Instead, they use the language of persuasion, lead by example, volunteer their services for free and initiate community self-help endeavors. In the Philippines, there is a saying, Ang marahang pangusap sa puso yung nakalulunas. In other words, do it through persuasion. Sometimes pakiusap, pakikisama, pakikipagkapa. So let's review. The culture of power mainly attracts politicians, the military. The culture of wealth attracts businessmen, tycoons. While the culture of common good will have civic society, spiritual leaders, humanitarians, educators, like Jose Rizal, Madbini, Ganhi, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, Osar Schindler, Amal, Sharif, Mari, Yerjai, Chabekati, Horemberg, Armon, Magsay, Sai, Awaris, and possibly Pope Francis. Belonging to the culture of the common good requires a lot of voluntary effort and sacrifice and with little or no monetary reward. For instance, if you work for civil, civic causes, you are part of a voluntary body which aims to represent the needs of a local community, like helping to provide shelter for the homeless or joining a reforestation project. These three cultures of power, wealth, and the common good are not unique. They are present in every society and have always coexisted throughout history, although a society may lean more on one or the other. China now is much obsessed with power. Well, you know how well um, China is uh, quite a, a dictatorship right now. Uh, there is so much violation of human rights, no freedom of speech, there's control of censorship of media, there's constant surveillance of people, and no mass gatherings. Well, Trump's America seems more inclined towards wealth than power. Bhutan, with its gross happiness index of social development, is apparently for the common good. However, through time, there's a fourth culture. A society constructs something unique, a unifying vision of life, which includes a worldview or idea of total reality. From this comes a people's core culture, which in turn promote the cultivation or culturing of the skills that realize its values. This is what we call ethnicity. The contents of ethnicity, according to UNESCO artists, oral traditions like your epics, chanting, or traditions, poet, uh, poetry, uh, riddles, press, proverbs, sayings, and expressions including languages, performing arts, traditional music, dance, and theater, social practices, rituals, and festive events. We have a lot of festive events. Knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe and traditional craftsmanship. The Philippines is very rich in all of this. 
we're a very old country when it comes to culture. You know? That's why you have a very strong ethnicity. And it's important to note that the core principles of Philippine ethnicity, which are Kapwa based, are built upon the culture of the common good rather than the culture of power or the culture of wealth. That is why relationships are far more important for most Filipinos than economic power. What is Kapwa? Kapwa is an awareness of the, of the rootedness of each one of us in the one divine essence within. All of humanity is one. That's the concept of Kapwa. And parallels in other Philippine languages could be Buot in Visayas and Nakam in Ilocano, Pamilamulamu among the Aitas of Pampanga, and so on. Or the closest to this uh, is Bayanihan. Uh, because Bayanihan implies oneness of the community. Hence, it implies, Kapwa implies the golden rule of all the great religions. Treat your neighbor as you treat yourself because your neighbor is yourself. This is the idea. If we think of the universe as a big infinite sun, the, at the center is the divine uh, essence, creative living principle of the universe. According to a study, many studies on Filipino worldview, uh, we view each one of us as a ray of God. Uh, one ray could be you and the other ray could be, could be me. So we all come from the same source. That's why we are all one. You know? Treat the other person as you treat yourself because the other person is also yourself. This is a Filipino core idea, especially in, as, as shown in the researches of uh, Dr. Berigi Enriquez and Dr. Susan Reyes and so on. You know? So each one of us is a unique expression of this divine essence within, creative living presence in the universe. Mount is a satin, I see like Nandakirang Medica. Every person is a soul, an individual rate of this infinite source. So, Kapwa is shared identity, shared goodness, shared divinity, the core of Filipino psychology, and humaneness at the highest level. This is pagpapakatao. Very difficult. Because it implies a unique moral obligation to treat one another as equal fellow human beings. In principle, Pakikipagawa excludes any action that may be detrimental or harmful to other human beings. In the end, gamitan. It is the capacity to recognize the good in every human being and then integrate oneself within the wider social fabric. And Pakikipagkapwa coincides with the preference for social harmony and collective well-being of the community in ASEAN. In fact, the Bangkok Declaration of 1993 codified and promoted collectivism and communitarianism. It has been said that the greater success of Southeast Asian countries in tackling COVID-19 compared to the US and Europe could be a communitarian culture that puts the common good ahead of individual freedoms. In spite of having different political systems, ASEAN countries all share to some degree a communitarian culture where social solidarity is highly valued. On the other hand, the emphasis on individual rights and freedoms in Western countries made it difficult to enforce the requirement that people wear masks or stay at home. Among the core principles of Filipino psychology rooted in Pakikipagkapo is malasakit. Most Filipinos don't understand what malasakit is all about, but if you look at the essence of malasakit, it means the capacity to take the burden of the other person as your own, akuin, and dalahin, dalahin ng kapwa. This is the outstanding virtue of many Filipino workers, including OFWs. So what makes Filipinos this thing? And how are we different from other ASEAN countries? Of course, there are many similarities, but it's important to know how distinct we are. We are people who are highly skilled in creating situations, activities, or things that bring people together. Since we love to connect with people, then we enjoy and excel in making things and activities that connect people. Filipinos then can be said to be masters of human connectivity. And in spite of living in rapidly changing times, our penchant for human connectivity has remained in that. We are very creative in things that bring people together, like our feasts of devotion. A Filipino fiesta, I think it will never die because it's the biggest single event in many provinces that brings together all kinds of people, especially in Bohol. And art brings us together. The artistic gifts of Filipinos are world class and are great social magnets, such as our weaving traditions, dance groups, vocal and instrumental performers, theater groups, ancestral houses, traditional architecture, and martial arts. And definitely an asset for tourism is the Filipino genius in organizing activities that really bring people together, like beauty pageants and big international events. For many Filipinos, togetherness is happiness. Being together, particularly during feasts and celebrations, is a much sought after ritual that symbolizes their deep sense of humanity, psychic unity. In the midst of the social disruptions brought about by the pandemic, Filipinos will grasp at anything that will fulfill this desire for 
togetherness. Thus, it is difficult for many Filipinas to observe social physical distancing. This may cause quarantines or quarantines or lockdown orders to be violated. But if we understand the real meaning of Pakikipagkapwa or one of the others, it is to be concerned for the common good or each other's well-being. In this light, physical distancing becomes an act of kindness and consideration for others. This holds true for webinars, blended learning, and other forms of online communication, which are the closest we can get to one another in this time of COVID. The strong arts to connect makes Filipinos a very expressive people. For the more we open up, the more we convey our feelings, thoughts, and ideas, the easier it is for, us, uh, for other people to relate to us. That's why Filipinos are said to be maximalist. We try to fill up every available space with forms and things. Why? Because this is from an, a very strong emotional urge to connect, no? to say everything about who we are, to express our feelings, ideas, and um, give other people a chance to know us and relate and connect to us. Even in modern art, no? we find a lot of this maximalism. And we are very open and expressive, especially to theater, the drama among Pinoy. We can say that our culture is a theater laboratory. Filipinas have so much energy for theater. We make sure that we retain the ability by training our children from the earliest age to become performers. When there are visitors in the house, we ask our children, oh, go out, your theater is there, your mino is there, perform something, sing, recite poetry, and so on. That's why we are the number one karaoke users in the whole world, according to a survey, because we love to express ourselves, especially through music, no? And this will lead to help. In fact, I think this should be a very, very important factor for making us more immune to COVID expressiveness, because expressiveness, according to doctors, especially to the performing arts, is an effective way of maintaining a healthy heart. Expressiveness releases harmful emotions and therefore makes our resistance to disease stronger. And expressions are very important as we go to the world. Expression and communication are indispensable elements of Filipino culture. Experiencing the great diversity of human and natural phenomena through television, cinema, radio, internet, and print media extends our senses, affirms our being, and connects us to the world. If these links to the outside world disappear, it's just like being deprived of eyes and ears. The more tools for experiencing the world, the better. We have to have many choices. For the Filipinos who value interconnectedness above all, these tools of perception are a non-negotiable demand. That's why we are said to be number one in social media in the whole world. Add to this means for connecting to the world, our facility for language and passion for travel and mobility. Our fetish for English can be fully explained by colonial mentality. Filipinos value it as their best link to the world. It will be in the greater interest, therefore, of the Philippines to extend its media linkages to other ASEAN countries, to promote regional, regional identity and solidarity. The ASEAN baseline report look into the interlinking of television channels of ASEAN countries as a form of cultural exchange, affording viewers the life, culture, and developments in ASEAN countries. Cambodia receives non Cambodian TV channels from Thailand. Lao PDR has seven channels from Thailand and Vietnam. Singapore reported having three channels from other ASEAN members. ASEAN movies are also being shown in local cinemas. There's a lot of uh, viewers in Cambodia, Filipino uh, cinemas or also soap operas. No? So we can really achieve cultural solidarity through television and cinema. Art is another very important force, powerful way of connecting to the world, to the arts. No? We feel most alive when interacting with people because our minds and hearts actively respond to each other in a visible, tangible manner. But the arts also do this to a great extent, especially the performing arts, including cinema. Art is life enhancing. Art has many levels of significance, sensuous, emotional, mental, that makes it life enhancing and life affirming. Researchers, for example, have found that placing art in hospitals has helped to improve patient well being, decrease days of stay, and reduce anxiety, depression, and pain. This one is a very good example. Um, art provides meaning. Art has become more pervasive in our lives now uh, more than ever before. As a coping mechanism, people from all over the world have turned to art to find respite from, from the anxiety and monotony of the seemingly endless waiting for the pandemic to be over. With the stay-at-home guidelines and limited available opportunities for recreation, 
many have spent their time watching films, listening to music, or even gardening. And art is really life. Many museums around the world have shifted their galleries online to provide virtual tours of their timeless work of art in a bid to continue the legacy of knowledge sharing despite physical restrictions imposed by lockdowns. Musicians have turned to live streaming to host concerts and provide much needed relief during a period filled with uncertainties. I will cite the example of a Bayanihan uh, musical performance for, uh, run for one man, uh, sponsored or uh, organized by Ryan Kayabiab and Marian Pastor. It was very success successful. In Southeast Asia, the pandemic ha has highlighted the importance and pervasive of the arts in society. In Malaysia, comic artists like Nixon Show and JNY Productions continue to upload animated drawings reflecting the realities of the pandemic on Instagram. Indonesia's Directorate General for Culture has launched a YouTube channel, Budaya Saya, to share artistic performances and artisans' masterclasses on dancing, painting, music, storytelling, and producing films. Vietnamese artist Le Duc Kiap created posters carrying empathic messages asserting the need to stay home. He creates posters that invoke patriotic emotions, hoping to encourage the people to associate self-isolation with fulfilling their civic duty to their nation. Many have attributed some of Vietnam's success in curbing the coronavirus to the power of art. Posters like the ones created by Le have galvanized the public to treat the pandemic seriously and play their part by acting responsibly. This is an example. Look, uh, frontliners uh, show their patriotism, no? And associating their, their uh, being of medical frontliners with nationhood. The dance music presentation to Cambodia and Myanmar, urging people to wear masks properly and was once transparently to protect us from the virus, are very engaging and effective. Similarly, poetry written by migrant workers in Singapore has brought issues concerning xenophobia and discrimination that affect this marginalized community to the fore, while underlining the need for discussion on how to build a more equal and inclusive society. And Probably the most important function of the arts for all time actually is their capacity to transform society so that it will serve the common good. This part of the art comes from the way they can make us feel and experience life as other people do. The arts introduce us to the world of outlooks, differing perceptions, and ways of understanding life and the world. The arts broaden our intellectual horizons and capacity for feeling making us open to cultural differences. Many people are not aware of this. Violent jihadists were mostly educated in fields such as science, engineering, and medicine. I am a graduate of engineering myself, uh, and so I'm familiar with this idea. People from similar cultural backgrounds who studied arts, humanities, and social sciences almost never follow the path of violence or extremism. Contrary to conventional assumptions is the book and art lovers who are far more likely to have the critical thinking ability to look at ideas flexibly. Why? Because they can hold different ideas in their heads at once and are far less likely to become radicalized, researchers say. They also have more empathy. In contrast, those who take rationalist courses such as electrical engineering are trained for years to think that there is only one right answer to each question and thus are more, much more open to radicalization. Science education fails to inculcate critical thinking in the way that the debates within the arts or arts teaching does. The culture of science teaching resolves issues into a binary choice of correct and incorrect or incorrect. Classic books and the arts on the other hand encourage viewing the world from different perspectives. The study of arts subjects involves discussion and debate, interpretation and the seeing of multiple points of view. Furthermore, a focus on the arts, particularly reading, creates strong empathy. The whole point of literature and drama is really to spend time in the heads of human beings other than ourselves. The result is a generation of students who are accepting of other cultures, who can see the humanity in people who are different. This turns them away from the jihadi world in which everything is either black or white. No, in the territories controlled by ISIS, many university courses have been eliminated, including drama, literature, Fine arts, comparative religion and philosophy, this is very unfortunate and very tragic for society. The result is a triumph of the black and white rationalist way of thinking. Characteristics of what rose for the engineering mindset is that it asks, why argue when there is one best solution? If only people were rational, remedies, remedies would be simple. However, that's not true. 
The humanities, essentially the arts and philosophy show us different ways of understanding the human condition. They make sense of the world. The arts, the stories, the ideas, and the words that help us make sense of our lives and our, and our world. They introduce us to people we have never met, places we have never visited, and ideas that may have never crossed our minds. Thus, the arts create a sense of community and can transcend the polarizing or divisive character of politics and economics because the arts really strengthen empathy, our ability to identify with others. By bringing us together to share and discuss, work of art can make us more tolerant of differences and of one another. Identifying with one another expands our notion of we and enable us to cooperate and act together on issues of common interest and concern. In the light of this study on the importance of the arts for social transformation, a sustained program for art exchanges and exposure to the arts of Southeast Asia in the educational system, media and cultural agreements of Asian countries must be given priority. A program for ASEAN arts awareness and studies will go a long way towards promoting solidarity and cooperation in ASEAN and will certainly strengthen the region to meet today's challenges, especially in combating the pandemic. I'll add just one more uh, trait of the Philippines that resonate with many ASEAN peoples because this is similar to what peoples, what cultures of ASEAN have. Filipinos are highly participatory. Rooted in the assumption that all of humanity is one, the idea of kapwa is a strong participatory tendency in Philippine culture. Everybody must have an active role, no matter how small, that's why you have the idea of Salim Pusa. Filipinos demand collective equal participation in the creative process, decision-making, and self-determination. No one must have a monopoly of the decision-making process. The deepest social aspirations of the Filipino are freedom, justice, and dignity. Monopoly, dictatorship, and curtailment of choices are anathema. Hindi pwede mo lang papipilian. The more choices, the better. Even in our traditional perspective in art, there is no single point of view. What we see is the omniscient or communal point of view, not that of the, not that of the individual. Do you know that even in our recipe, in our recipes in cooking, there is no recipe for a single person, according to, according to many uh, authorities on our culinary arts, there's no recipe for a single person. Uh, every Filipino recipe is good for at least 10 people. Um, well, with the kind of perspective that we see in our traditional art is also what we see in Balinese art. Look at this. This is the point of view of the community, not that of the individual. Yes, another example. And this is true for Balinese art. This is not the Renaissance single point of view or perspective. And even in our uh, traditional textile art, you can see many different, different focal centers or even, even in our modern art, like the Fernando Ocampo. So communal togetherness in traditional village communities of ASEAN expands sense of self because we perform so many rituals where we, where, we be, where we do things together. The many rituals that indigenous or folk peoples observe in Southeast Asia as a way of affirming shared values as in our feast of devotion to a great saint Group pilgrimages to sacred sites are praying together for the bountiful harvest, promote solidarity, a concern for the common good and creative inspiration. Look at how rich we are. You know, um, every, every person in this ASEAN, in our traditional village communities is an artist because holistic culture demands that we participate in all kinds of activities, that we have a knowledge, we have skills in all kinds of activities. Although we have one specialization, but still we have to be as well-rounded as possible. That's why everybody in ASEAN traditional communities is an artist. That's why there is so much um, uh, diversity in ASEAN art. Look at these examples, no? I don't have to mention um, specifically where these arts come from. I just, I just want to say the richness of arts coming from where? This is Myanmar, uh, this is Borobudur, uh, uh, Cambodia, uh, Myanmar, Thailand, and so on. Uh, this is Indonesia, uh, Indonesia, yes, Indonesian Gamelan, Filipino, Fugao, and so on. Uh, it's Sulawesi, Sulawesi architecture made by farmers, people's art, because everybody's an artist. Yes, Fugao, and so on. This is Silocano, uh, this is uh, Blaan, uh, Magpagindanao, Yakan, Tausu, Tausu, and from Dayak, Borneo, yeah, Philippine Nuts, all over. Yeah? Uh, metal smithing from Pampanga, 
Yes, the Corintang stand, how beautiful the Corintang stand is from the Maranao. And then our dances, dances of ASEAN, and so on. Right? Rituals like this festa from Naga, and so on. Yes, what paper machine are from Paite. We're very rich, no? And based on the concept of Kapwa, there is no, there is no duality of life. Making people absolutely equal in principle. Nobody has a right to regard himself as above or more important than others. Humility is highly prized. That's why the privilege of one must be the privilege of all. The law applies to all or none at all. The idea of equality is so deeply ingrained in the Filipino psyche. It is a non-negotiable value. Well, I'll further explain uh, what this is based on. Within every human being, there are two worlds, the good and the bad one. Which one wins depends on whom we feed. Goethe said that treat a human being like an animal and he will be like a beast. Because uh, the bad wolf comes out. If you treat a person like an animal, the bad wolf comes out. And when an authoritarian leadership disregards the law with impunity, this brings out the bad wolf in people and encourages the lawless elements in society to do likewise. If the officials themselves do not comply with the law, it sends a message that the law means nothing to them. So who will take them seriously? That's why lawlessness breeds lawlessness. And we really have to respect a, every human being as sacred. There is nothing more dehumanizing to a human being and to feel is merely being treated as a machine. The consequences for an organization are a rapid turnover rate, absenteeism, safety violations, high accident rate, high risk of illness and low productivity. According to an industrial psychologist, John Burton, in the workplace and in other relationships, it's fail to recognize the individual as more than a robot, we see negative behaviors such as lack of cooperation and absenteeism. The creative human, creative, sensitive human soul rebels against being treated as a mere machine or robot. This is true for all of ASEAN cultures. Nothing could be more troubling or terrifying to a person than the order, just obey or just follow the law. Without a clear and valid basis, an order is a form of coercion and will always be resisted because it violates the basic tenet of our being a creative, soulful, and divine nature that always demands respect. So a compassionate approach, however, um, will really work better in a Southeast Asian cultural context. Why? Southeast Asians like to be treated as friends, as family members, as partners within a community of individuals working together for the common good. The need for discipline must be understood as directed towards this goal and not as a form of punishment. Of course, there will always be a few regal citizens who deserve harsher treatment. So my, I, to summarize my main points, at any time and anywhere in the world, three cultures have always existed, the culture of power, wealth, and the common good. There is a fourth culture, which is a creative uh, construct of every society. And in the Philippines, it's important to know that our ethnicities, core principles, and can be the basis of similar uh, philosophies in ASEAN can be the basis of ASEAN cooperation. And it is built upon the culture of the common good rather than the culture of power or the culture of wealth. Thirdly, Filipinos love to connect to people and excel in doing things that connect people, making it difficult for them to observe social, physical distancing. But in the light of the philosophy of Kekepagkapo or concern for the common good, social distancing becomes an act of kindness and consideration for others. Fourthly, for Filipinos who value interconnectedness above all, the technology of communication, social media, and the arts are vital means of expression, extension of the senses, windows of the world, and a force for social transformation. I think the same applies to all of us. And lastly, a compassionate approach to curbing the spread of COVID-19 will work better in the Southeast Asian, Southeast Asian cultural context. Southeast Asians like to be treated as friends, as family members, as partners within a community of individuals working together for the common good. And thank you very much for listening. Rami Salamat po. Thank you very much, Dr. Felipe M. De Leon, Jr. If you have questions about the presentation of Dr. Felipe M. De Leon, Jr., better if you type in all your questions in the Q&A chat box. You can access that by clicking the Q&A icon you can find at the bottom of the interface 
of this webinar. Your questions will be answered during the Q&A session. By the way, we just activated the polling feature where you can access the survey about this webinar. You can see the polling icon at the bottom of the interface of this webinar as well. Click the polling icon to access the survey and please do accomplish the survey before the webinar ends. Now, we present to you the omnibus video fostering ASEAN spirit and promoting ASEAN awareness during this 2020 year of ASEAN identity. The omnibus video presentation portrays the unwavering support and unity of the ASEAN member states in utilizing the power of art to explore and develop new creative platforms to convey safety measures by working together with hope, caring, and resiliency. Let us all watch this. Praise Now to moderate our Q&A session, I give you again, Sir Chris Miliano. Sir Chris. Thank you, Diane. And of course, thank you to our keynote speakers, Professor June and Professor Patrick. I hope you don't mind me calling you by your first names. Mm -hmm. um, sure, Chris. Uh, mm -hmm. I would, before I uh, uh, read some of the questions, I just would like to uh, read off from some of the reactions of our uh, attendees um, to let you know we have more than 300 exactly 334 now on board listening to us. Uh, from Randy Nobleza, 
uh, very comprehensive and extensive ASEAN art initiatives, hands down, very relevant and inspiring to all artists and the cultural sector. From uh, Maria Diana Sabado, thank you. It was a great presentation. Art indeed played a big role in this time of COVID, hoping that all cultural workers and the whole arts and cultural industry will recover from this pandemic. From Mark De La Cruz, I love how Dr. Patrick Flores thinks, articulates, explains his views of the culture and art world today in the context of the ASEAN. Thank you, Sir Patrick. Very inspiring and insightful talk containing practical suggestions that we can hold and apply as we move forward to the new normal. Please continue to send your questions. We have a few minutes, uh, uh, barely, about 10 to 15 minutes to tackle your question. Um, uh, Professor Patrick, Professor June, I've classed clustered uh, three related hmm. questions and uh, uh, you may uh, in, in, uh, you may address them as you will. Uh, the first three questions, what is your advice to artists, performers and creative professionals, especially now that creative content has started migrating to online digital platforms? A related question, what do you think would be the role of the cultural sector in the post pandemic scenario, especially here in the Philippines. And from, um, from Sherwin Ramosa, this question is, to address, uh, is addressed to both uh, resource speakers. In your opinion or experience, what works best, community-led arts development or government-led through policies and laws? Uh, Professor June, Professor Patrick. I can, I can I think the more successful one would be the community-led initiatives. Simply because sometimes uh, the bureaucracy in the government um, uh, takes so much time for the, the goods to be delivered, while there is more 